translated as to have life or to wish life upon another. Whereas the word curse meant the opposite, to wish death upon another. As we bow our heads in prayer, we remember then those beatitudes, those blessings, those life-giving blessings that God bestows on those who are poor, those who mourn, the meek of heart, those who hunger and thirst for God, those who are merciful, pure in heart, the peacemakers, those persecuted. Blessed are they, may they have life to the fullest. So let us pray. Good and loving God, we pray your blessing upon us, your life-giving spirit, as we begin today's conference. Instill in us a hunger to protect the dignity of every human person, the unborn child, the disabled person, the vulnerable and marginalized of our society, those suffering near death. As we ponder this day the legacy of abortion in our nation and in our world, we pray for the grace, Lord, to commit ourselves in solidarity with women and with their unborn children. Keep us mindful of our task to listen to others, especially to the stories of women for whom considering abortion is a lived reality. Gracious God, we call upon your Holy Spirit to help us engage constructively and with love all those who disagree with us. Help us to find ways to work together to build a culture of life, narrowing the gap between the rich and the poor, the sick and the healthy, the child and the unborn child. May our lives be a witness to your gospel of life, your gospel of blessing. We make this prayer in communion with our blessed mother Mary and through his, her son, our Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Father Bosco. Good morning, everyone. My name is Matteo Caulfield, and I am the co-director of outreach for this, this year's conference. Before we begin our keynote address, we want to remind everyone of our speech and expression policy here at Georgetown. As an institution of higher education, one specifically committed to Catholic and Jesuit tradition Georgetown University is committed to free and open inquiry, deliberation, and debate in all matters, and the untrammeled verbal and nonverbal expression of ideas. It is Georgetown University's policy to provide all members of the university community, including faculty, students, and staff, the broadest possible latitude to speak, write, listen, challenge, and learn. While it is recognized that not everyone may share the same views as the speaker, it is expected that everyone in attendance respect the right of the speaker and our conference board to share their perspectives and ideas by not causing a disruption to the events and activities. With that said, we are honored to welcome our keynote speaker. She is the founder and current director of publications for Rehumanize International, a nonpartisan secular organization dedicated to bringing an end to all aggressive violence against human beings through education, discourse, and action. After a personal, convert, a personal conversion to the cause against abortion as a teen, she was able to claim and defend a holistic ethic of nonviolence during her time in university, the consistent life ethic. She was the recipient of the Susan B. Anthony List Young Leader Award in 2014 for her trailblazing pro-life leadership. She has been featured in news media outlets such as MSNBC, Maria Claire, Cosmopolitan, The New York Times, The Washington Post, Vice News, and many more. Please welcome our keynote speaker, Amy Murphy.
Hi, good morning. Can everyone hear me? Am I just backstage right now? I'm on, I'm on the big screen. Oh, okay. Well then, I'm getting prepped here. Um, while I get my presentation up. I give it a couple of minutes till 11.15. It's 11.13 right now. I wish I could see everyone's beautiful faces, but alas. I hope everyone's doing well. Ooh, I forgot I have a touch screen. a beautiful day here in Pittsburgh. You know, I, I wish I knew where everyone was coming from, from all over the country. <laughs> We're good to start. Okay, I will go ahead and get started. Um, okay, good morning, y'all. Uh, I'm Amy Murphy. I am the founder of Rehumanize International. I am so excited to be talking with y'all today about building the pro-life movement of the next generation. To begin, I thought I'd let y'all catch a glimpse of why I adopted this philosophy as my own, this pro-life philosophy. When I was 16, I was an atheist, feminist, queer, pro-choicer. I was in an on-again, off-again relationship with a guy. But on Valentine's Day, just about 16 years ago, he forced himself on me and raped me. After he raped me, our relationship was over. <laughs> Yet March went by and April came and I still hadn't had a period. I was panicking, thinking that I was pregnant by my rapist and thinking of nothing but abortion. Think about it, I was a straight A student, a starter on the JV basketball team, an honor band musician slated by all of my teachers to be headed for an Ivy League school. Word got around that I thought I was pregnant and eventually it got back to him. So I was sitting in my drafting class one day and he came and pulled me out of class. He said, Amy, you need to get an abortion. I'll drive you and I'll pay for it, but you need to get it taken care of. Though I looked at him with incredulous anger, what he said next shocked me to the core. He told me, Amy, if you don't get an abortion, I'm thinking that I might kill you. In that moment, I became pro-life. I felt a solidarity with all pre-born children, vulnerable to violence. In the moment when my own life was threatened, 
I adopted a consistent philosophy of human rights, a consistent ethic of nonviolence, a consistent ethic of life. Today, at 32, I am twice as old as I was then. I've been involved in pro-life activism for more than half of my life. It's been 10 years since I founded Rehumanize International right out of college. And because I just stepped down from the role of executive director at Rehumanize just weeks ago, I thought it might be fitting to leave you all with a message of hope for the future as I pass the torch to the next generation. So here was me at 16, very small, very cute. No, I was actually the same height. Um, and in that moment, I just became pro-life. So hope is a beautiful thing, but it's a dangerous thing because it propels us and it shakes us out of our apathy. Augustine of Hippo said, hope has two beautiful daughters. Their names are anger and courage. Anger at the way things are and courage to see that they do not remain as they are. I am angry that we have lost roughly 60 million unique, unrepeatable human beings to this violence. And I have courage to stand up against a culture and an industry and a law that dehumanizes pre-born children and has done so for 48 years. Because of this anger and this courage, I have hope that we will see abortion abolished in my lifetime. For 48 years, there has been a nationwide pro-life movement dedicated to upholding the lives of pre-born children and attempting to end abortion. And I have gratitude to those who have come before us and have worked so tirelessly for the unborn. While I also recognize that regrettably, 48 years after Roe, abortion is even more entrenched into our culture than it was back then. We face new times, a different cultural context and extreme political polarization. I think it's necessary for us all to have a reckoning with our movement and make a roadmap, a plan for what comes next. A moment of reckoning for our nation floored me on January 6th, just a few weeks ago. When alt writers, white supremacists, and neo Nazis attempted a coup of our capital, threatening to kill legislators and take the government in the name of Trump, most of the nation sat at home, wide eyed in disgust and horror. When all was said and done, dozens of people were injured. Five unrepeatable humans were killed by this violent insurrection. And now we are faced with the unavoidable fallout from four years of a Trump presidency after decades of the pro-life movement being sycophantically dragged behind the right wing. When the GOP, the champion of the unborn, seems content to allow racism, white supremacy, anti-Semitism, misogyny, and violence go unchecked, it makes sense that people of conscience are leaving the active pro-life movement in droves. I can't tell you the sheer number of despairing comments I've heard from otherwise dedicated lifelong pro-life people in the wake of the Trump administration's abuses and violent dehumanizing rhetoric strong young leaders who would otherwise boldly stand up for pre-born lives are now distancing themselves from this movement because it's associated with such malfeasance and negligence and violence. In the face of this dilemma, but also knowing the dignity of the pre-born, the response must not be to dwell in despair and dissociate from the cause, but instead to build something better. We need to build up new paradigms, new strategies, and more than anything, new leaders 
and we're willing to boldly explore and experiment with out of the box thinking. So this is where you come in. Each of you watching today has a responsibility as someone who knows better to do better. I once said that when I was 16 and all that drama happened, that I became forever unsettled about the violence in our world, particularly the violence of abortion. I made it my mission as a teen to go unsettle everyone else because being comfortable in a world so steeped in violence is complacency. It is complicity. So now I'm charging each and every one of you to go unsettle the world. But how do you do that? Well, we know some things not to do, right? We know to never condone or be comfortable with racism or white supremacy or anti-Semitism. We know to never engage in violence to achieve our aims. We know to never sacrifice our principles for political expediency. Beyond that list of things you reject though, what should be included within the blueprint of the pro-life movement of the next generation? For the next 30 to 40 minutes, I'd like to explore some ideas I have with you and hope for what we can achieve if we work together in humility for human life and dignity. My first suggested idea is one that is foundational to all of my work. Respond to our culture steeped in violence and dehumanization and political polarization by embracing the inherent dignity of each and every human being and rejecting all aggressive violence against any member of our human family. Another word for this idea is the consistent life ethic. It is a philosophy based on the idea that every human being, regardless of circumstance, shares an equal, unchangeable, inherent human dignity. In the process of adopting this CLE back when I was 16, I realized that I'd been excluding pre-born humans when considering human rights. So the question that I hope you'll mull on today and going forward is, who am I leaving out? When considering human rights, when I talk about my love for humanity, is there anyone that I'm excluding from my circle of concern? When we exclude certain human groups from human rights, we engage in discrimination but human rights are for human beings, no exceptions there. Indeed, they aren't born rights or white rights or rich rights. They're just human rights. And yet the political duopoly that we've been raised in is steeped in violence and discrimination and inconsistency when it comes to human rights and dignity. For example, the title of pro-life has perhaps become a sort of misnomer when the pro-life cause has aligned itself with warmongering politicians in the Republican Party who support the death penalty unwaveringly. Considering that the child in the womb has the potential to become also a soldier on the battlefield, a child caught behind enemy lines, a prisoner on death row, or a disabled adult, we have the responsibility to value their life at all stages, in all circumstances. Likewise, however, the anti-death penalty Democrats have been dealing with a similar multiplicity with human life for many years, because the respect for human life is on the case of the death row inmate is often aligned with the support for abortion, euthanasia, and even during the Obama administration, most liberals were stunningly silent in the face of war and torture perpetuated by their own party. We'll see how they respond to a Biden presidency. These double standards stem from the idea of loving the vague nebulous idea of human rights more than we love and respect the humans behind those rights. If we actually love and respect each and every human being. The ethical statement I would then put forth is that we must never directly kill any human being. This leaves room for the principle of double effect 
and self-defense is provided for under these terms. But this ensures that we properly respect each and every instance of human life from conception to natural death. It means that we oppose all acts of aggressive violence, abortion, unjust war, euthanasia, capital punishment, torture, police brutality, embryonic stem cell research, and all forms of abuse. But perhaps you can see the Americans of our age often participate in exclusion too. U.S. culture has spawned this American first, humanity second worldview. We even saw this in Trump's America first rhetoric during the past four years, six years even, that went so far to even dehumanize Muslims, Latinos, and Black folks in our own country. But I hope you can agree with some 14 New England Catholic bishops who wrote in response to the Vietnam War. We must in conscience criticize the ethical validity of any doctrine, attitude, or policy which gets, seems to give American lives an intrinsic superiority over those of other people. Every human life, regardless of nationality, color, or ideology is sacred and its defense and protection must be of deep concern to us. Honest human rights work doesn't leave some humans out and we need the understanding that a culture of peace is built upon the respect for life and dignity of each and every human being. That means no racism, no sexism, no ageism, no ableism. However, we face a culture that perhaps condones dehumanization and killing more often than it prevents it. And in a time when many people are more attached to their political party than their religious or ethical principles, it sometimes feels like we're swimming upstream. The two-party duopoly has forced us into this nightmare situation where every two to four years, we're asked to throw some humans under the bus for political expediency and power. If we vote for a GOP candidate, we're likely to be backing someone who says they wanna reduce abortions. However, that same candidate is also likely to condone or support the state-sanctioned violence of hawkish war policies, torture, capital punishment, and police brutality against communities of color. Contrarywise, on the other end of the duopoly, if we vote for a Democratic candidate, that often means that we're supporting someone who might support more humane policies on immigration, poverty, and criminal justice reform. However, that same candidate is likely to support the state-sanctioned violence of abortion on demand, or embryonic stem cell research, or even the killing of vulnerable disabled populations through euthanasia and assisted suicide. I'm not going to go over how the political history got us here today, but I will say this, the political alliance of the GOP and the pro-life movement has really done a number on our witness as pro-lifers. The mushy middle watching from the sidelines has seen cruelty and lack of care for the abortion vulnerable poor as synonymous with the anti-abortion cause. In the era of Trump, the culture of cruelty has gone a mile further. We have seen anti-abortion people supporting white nationalism, violence against Black Lives Matter protesters, criminalization of LGBTQ people, and even for downright fascism. In the coup attempt we saw on January 6th, we saw right-wing extremists attempt to kidnap and execute politicians who didn't back them. It's horrific. People who stand for the inherent dignity of all human beings should boldly stand against such dehumanization and violence. Ultimately, I can't tell you how to vote. Personally, I can tell you that I refuse to give my vote to anyone who supports legal violence. If a candidate supports abortion or hoggish foreign policy or torture or euthanasia or assisted suicide or capital punishment or police brutality or any other form of aggressive violence, I cannot in good conscience vote for them. It should be common sense to demand that politicians oppose the intentional aggressive harming of any members of our human family. 
it's such a low bar, it's practically on the floor. And yet we continually get stuck with an ethical dilemma wherein we are con consistently asked to choose the lesser of two evils. What if being asked to support the lesser of two evils over and over and over again has resulted in this particular political moment where the evil just keeps getting more and more evil? I firmly believe that we as people of conscience need to stand up and demand better than the options that we've been given. Instead of being sleepily led into one of the violent silos, whether Democrat or Republican, we have to think outside the boxes that we've been led to believe we must support. I don't know what the precise answer is, but I know that we have to engage in some creative nonviolent thinking to build a better, holy, life-affirming future. Speaking of outside the box, one thing that I really appreciate about the consistent life ethic is that it transcends the boxes of party affiliation, religious belief, or socioeconomic background. It is a philosophy that is accessible to all. This is vital because if we want to end violence, especially the violence that is abortion, we need to have everyone on board. To illustrate this point, I want you to picture this. A building is burning. People are trapped inside. Can you imagine if the fire chief stood with a checklist and asked every firefighter who came to assist, excuse me, firefighter, but are you straight Christian, Republican? Because if not, I'll just have to ask you to head on home. We don't want your kind here. Like, that's absurd, right? If the house is on fire, we need all hands on deck to save lives and put the fire out. And yet a lot of the pro-life movement has been acting like this absurd and irresponsible fire chief. I've heard dozens of stories from pro-life atheists, LGBT people, and progressives who were not allowed to volunteer with pregnancy resource centers, pro-life leadership, or life-affirming nonprofits. We could probably make abortion illegal with just Christians or just conservatives, but we can't truly end abortion unless everyone believes that it is that it is an abhorrent, unjust act of violent aggression against vulnerable preborn children. The response to this exclusion and discrimination is a spirit of radical inclusivity. We should be a movement of every human standing for every human. We should be a movement that seeks to rehumanize those who have often been seen as the other side. We should be a movement that engages in encounter with everyone in an effort to change hearts and minds and build a world where every human being is respected, valued, and protected. To get you started on living this idea, here are some practical steps to make our movement radically inclusive. Number one, don't make assumptions. We're not all Christian or conservative or straight or whatever. Number two, the statements of faith to get involved in pro-life activism or volunteerism are bad, honestly, and pose a barrier to entry. The small box can lead people to believe that they're unwelcome in the movement. At an event, and thirdly, at an event with prayer, before you begin praying, say, if you pray or if you're a person of XYZ faith, please join us in prayer. Just doing so is an acknowledgement that not everyone there might be a person of faith. Next, make sure that your events are accessible for disabled people. Do you have easy to access ramps and elevators? Are your video events ca closed captioned or do you have simultaneous ASL interpretation? And next, and lastly, Respect LGBT and non-traditional people who are on your side and those on the other side too. Make sure that they feel safe enough to mention their partner and their pronouns. Something to consider, does an anti-abortion event need a chastity speaker or an anti-gay marriage speaker? If we oppose abortion because it kills a human being, I'd humbly ask, aren't those subjects a little off topic from the discussion of ending violence against the pre-born? I had several club members when I was in undergrad who stopped coming to pro-life events because they went to a major pro-life conference and the main stage had an anti-gay marriage speaker and they were gay, but they were super pro-life. 
Again, if we want to end violence, including the violence of abortion, we need to have everyone on board. When I founded Rehumanize International back in 2011 as Like Matters Journal, I wanted to make sure that it would be a space in which I would have felt welcome as 16 year old me. Remember, I was a gay atheist feminist liberal and a lot of the pro-life movement didn't quite leave me feeling like I belonged. I think we should all strive to make sure that wherever a person is coming from, that they'll feel welcome, that there's space for them in this movement for human rights. Ultimately, we wanna meet people where they are and feel confident inviting them to a radically inclusive movement. Meeting people where they are isn't always easy and it often demands something of us. I love stories again, so imagine this. You're on vacation in Hungary, trying to convey some vital piece of information to a person you've just met, but you only speak English and they only speak Hungarian. While some vague feel of what you're saying might be conveyed through emotions and hand gestures, ultimately you'll both be left feeling confused and probably upset by the interaction. What's the message here? Learn to speak the language. And no, I don't necessarily mean that you should go learn Hungarian. What I really mean is that we need to be able to use the lexicon of the folks we're trying to reach. Even within our own nation, where most of us speak American English, there are words and phrases that signal political alliances or ethical persuasion or religious background. I talked with someone just last week who expressed anxiety when I used words like oppression and social justice and privilege. He insisted that we shouldn't use such Marxist language. I responded that we should be able to read and learn from the sources that are in the mainstream youth culture and test everything and hold fast to what is good and true. We can talk about abortion as the violent act of oppression that it is, we should be able to dialogue about the hardships of pregnancy as converse with wombless, childless male privilege. We need to have the skills to meet the overwhelmingly politically disaffected youth who still fervently believe in social justice. And we do that by meeting them on their level, by speaking the same language. One other key thing to remember is that we all come from different backgrounds. By using arguments that highlight a shared basis of understanding, we can reach people from all walks of life. What I mean is we should appeal to the common principles that we share regardless of faith or political background, logic, reason, and goodwill. Oh, and learn the, learning the art of calling in versus calling out is a crucial skill. When someone has an opinion where, say, they support an act of violence, like abortion, the response that meets them where they are is to call in, to affirm the good that they do believe in, like, say, opposition to the death penalty, and challenge them to be better and support human dignity in all circumstances. Supporting human dignity in all circumstances is definitely a paradigm that we aren't used to seeing in our violent two-party duopoly. Often, we're made to feel as if we must choose between the rights of one human and another. It's a trolley problem, right? Choose the pre-born child or the immigrant, or perhaps we can save the disabled person, but only if we sacrifice the person on death row. It's a false dichotomy. And of course, where else do we see this false choice than in the center of the abortion debate itself? Perhaps you're familiar with the lie perpetuated by the abortion industry and pro-choice proponents, even though they might not say it outright, that we might must choose between women's rights and success or the rights and lives of their children. But these folks are more or less implying that in order to be empowered, women must have the legal right to kill their children. This is a falsehood that lies in the patriarchal structures which insist that the wombless male body is the default. Think about it. If men's bodies are the norm, then anyone who seeks a career would seem to need the ability to be free from responsibilities of bearing children. 
If men's bodies are the norm, then menstruation is taboo and pregnancy is like a disease. If men's bodies are the norm, then it seems that women must be just like men in order to be successful. To say that women must be just like men is not respecting the unique characteristics of women. It is not true equality to require that women give up that unique life-giving capacity in order to be successful. It is submitting to the structure of the patriarchy to perpetuate the idea that mothers are inherently disempowered, that they cannot achieve their dreams and goals without the right to kill their children. This is an especially insidious lie on college campuses as college aged women have abortions at a higher rate than any other age group. It's an unspoken understanding. Don't get pregnant in college because if you do, you won't be able to succeed or graduate or get a good career. You won't have any happiness in life. It's like that thing from Mean Girls, like don't have sex because you will get pregnant and you will die. But that's a, an exaggeration, a huge exaggeration. And there is an antidote to this false dichotomy that would make us choose between a woman and her child. We can love them both. We can be proud advocates of the dignity of women by standing up to the patriarchy and demanding better for pregnant people and supporting them during pregnancy and beyond. And we can be proud advocates of the dignity of the preborn by standing up for their right to life while also accompanying their parents through what will likely be a difficult time. But critics might say, Amy, support for abortion is integral to feminism. Yet I'd argue that historically, the central pr principles of feminism are equality, non-discrimination, and non-violence. Equality is the idea that all human beings, regardless of gender, race, religion, politics, age, size, or any other circumstance, are equal in dignity, moral value, and before the law. Non-discrimination is the concept that any act of discrimination, whether it be sexism, racism, ageism, or ableism, is contrary to this equal human dignity, to human equality. And lastly, nonviolence is the idea that non-discrimination in practice means that every human being has the right to live a life free from violence. And really, when you think about it, any sort of feminism that supports abortion actually reinforces structures of inequality, discrimination, and violence. Because the zygote, embryo, or fetus is a human being according to all scientific measures, abortion is clearly an act of violence against this child. It intentionally kills them. Whether it's by starvation, dismemberment, or poisoning, a successful abortion always aggressively kills a human being. And because aggressive violence is always an act of discrimination, it creates a structure of inequality. Abortion is directly contrary to the core principles of feminism. In truth, when you actually examine the core principles of feminism, the better question is whether you can be pro-choice and feminist. Feminism properly understood seems to point to a holistic, consistent ethic of life. But where does that leave us with regard to the person who seeks an abortion? What is the pro-life feminist response? Last year, I worked with the president and CEO of Americans United for Life, Catherine Glenn Foster, to publish a white paper on exactly this topic. It's entitled, Restoring the Heart, Healing the Communal Trauma of Abortion, through a restorative justice system. Look it up at the link there because this will just be a brief overview. In it, we begin by assessing the problem of abortion and the problem of dehumanizing retributive justice models. We all know that abortion is horrific violence on a massive scale, but did you know that our nation has one of the most harsh and inhumane justice systems in the world? According to the U.S. Bureau of Justice Statistics, over 6.6 .6 million persons were in the U.S. were in the U.S. adult correctional system at the end of 2016. Over two million were incarcerated, representing about four percent of the U.S. population, 
the highest known rate of incarceration in the world. Yet recidivism rates or re-entry into the justice system because of recommitting a crime are around 43%, which is hugely high. When we apply that to abortion, that could result in more lives lost. The system isn't one that seems to be either aimed at or especially successful at rehabilitation and restoration. All of this is to hardly scratch the surface of the horrid treatment of incarcerated people. Beatings by guards, abuse from fellow inmates, sensory deprivation through solitary confinement, disintegration of community by cutting off mail delivery, and subhuman living conditions all contribute to dehumanization. Some may insist that these awful conditions are fitting punishment for criminals. But as those who defend the unchangeable inherent dignity of every human being from conception to death, we should confidently push back against such dehumanizing treatment. We declare that our current model of vengeful retributive justice does not fit within a vision of human centered dignity affirming justice for all involved. It does not love them both. We can see how retributive justice systems dehumanize. So we know that we must build a model of justice that rests on a foundational belief in the inherent and immutable dignity of each and every human being, born and pre-born, offender and offended. We should build a compassionate model based on the dignity of every human being that recognizes and acknowledges legitimate grievance and that makes amends and seeks to generate positive outcomes rather than ensuring a balance of harms. All that a balance of harms does is continue the cycle of traumatization, passing on more harm and maintaining the rift in community. Since the goal of a restorative system is not punishment, but healing, we must involve everyone who has caused or been it otherwise impacted by the particular harm. This restorative system should ask how and why the offender violated the victim and address that impact on the lives of all involved. It should see how all parties were impacted by social structures and institutions like workplaces or colleges. It should organize communities to heal together, repair the systemic injustices and make restitution for the harm that was done. However, state and federal pro-life laws have provided for civil and criminal penalties for abortionists only. While these laws are well-intentioned and crafted to protect women and children, the system does not adequately address either the root causes of abortion or its deep and far-reaching harms. The current models incarceration and fines levied against an abortionist do not help the woman to heal or address the concerns that led her to abortion in the first place or restore her relationships after the trauma. Achieving this model of restorative justice will require several major changes, which should include that crimes relating to abortion may belong in a family court or other setting outside of the traditional retributive justice system. And the judge would exist more as a counselor and less as an arbiter of punishment. And the participation of everyone involved, including the pregnant person, their partner, the families, maybe the workplace, and perhaps what other, other institutions and friends participated in or feel the trauma of the loss. So they can all acknowledge the harm that was done in the violence of abortion, understand and address the root causes and complex situations that led to the abortion and connect them to post-abortion healing and care. And lastly, the victim's voice must be heard and their concerns weighed on the question of restitution. Building a restorative justice model into our pro-life laws does have the power to change hearts and minds as people see the compassion as we love them both. But I truly believe that we should embrace this option primarily because it is the justice solution that most aligns with our pro-life belief 
that our shared, inherent, unchangeable human dignity should be the center of all moral action and public policy. This is why in upholding the rights of pre-born children, we must be certain not to violate the shared intrinsic dignity of those who have participated in abortions. The foundational principle of human dignity at the core of restorative justice necessitates a whole paradigm shift away from the question of punishment and instead towards the task of creating authentic human-centered restoration. In doing so, we can reduce the number of repeat abortions, heal families, and further build a culture of life. Our restorative justice system is pro-life and pro-woman. It is a model which demonstrates that we don't have to choose between the mother and the child. We can love them both. But how do we love them both in more than just our words and our principles? Even if you talk the talk, you've still got to walk the walk. And you begin that action wherever you are. All politics is local. And there is violence happening in your community. I mean, think about it. Abortion is pushed as the only way out for high school and college aged women. When we review the data, we see that of all the patients having abortions, 12% are under 20, while 33% are between the ages of 20 and 24. College aged women are the most vulnerable to abortion with teens falling not too far behind. So then we know what the next question should be. How are we actively being community and giving mutual aid to those pregnant and parenting students in need to save all involved from the trauma and violence of abortion? You must be walking with them, accompanying them on this journey as best you can. Oh, and one big thing, you should be working to break down pregnancy and maternity stigma among your peers, in your school, and in your churches. As I've often discussed with people who worry over how their parents or their church will react to their unplanned pregnancy, though extramarital sex might be a sin in your religion, pregnancy and motherhood are not. When it'd be easier to have an abortion to be free from the stigma of unplanned pregnancy, we must tell young pregnant people in these circumstances to hold their heads up high Choosing life in our very anti-life culture can be hard when your peers and your church would shame you instead of support you. Support them. Be a witness to the value and dignity of her life and the life of her child right where you are. And I want to leave you with this. Ultimately, the things we do daily, weekly, monthly in our own communities are more important than a singular vote in nearly any election. Enact justice, live peace daily, right where you are. We must not see voting every four years as our sole action towards supporting human rights. The work begins again today it doesn't end here just because the election's over. How we choose to live daily for and in solidarity with the marginalized and oppressed will always have more of an impact than your one vote for president or Senate or any other major political office. Statistically speaking, your vote will have an infinitesimally small impact on the outcome of the race. But 100% of the time, it will impact your conscience. Your vote indicates which groups of humans you are willing to sacrifice for the greater good. Rather than trying to justify making that compromise, make a commitment to yourself and to the community that you live in to live justice daily. Don't depend on politicians to do it for you. Though freedom has been touted as the ultimate virtue in this nation, I challenge our hyper-individualistic interpretation. I learned just this week from the book, How We Show Up by Mia Birdsong, that the word free comes from the Indo-European word fria, meaning beloved. Fun fact, my name, Amy, also means beloved. 
Oh, and uh, the word friend also comes from that same root word. Historically, a free person was someone who was joined to a tribe of pe free people by ties of kinship and rights of belonging. Freedom was the idea that together, we can ensure that we all have the things that we need, love, food, shelter, safety. It was a model of interdependence. We need to get back to this idea that no human is an island. Our freedom is for community, is for solidarity, is for mutual aid. The principles of mutual aid, solidarity, and community will be the hallmarks of a holistically pro-life culture. And living those principles starts wherever you live. It takes hard work and effort to connect with your community. Actually building relationships with those in need is hard. It can be physically exhausting to help a mom care for a colicky baby when she needs emergency babysitting. It can be emotionally challenging to reject suburban white flight and invest yourselves in uprooting structural racism in your hearts and in your communities by pursuing racial reconciliation and reparations. And it can be hard on your self-control to part with the $10 that you were gonna spend on a fancy drink at Starbucks in order to buy a pack of diapers or wipes for a family in need in your neighborhood. But we, can create, we can't create a pro-life culture if we continue to stay up in our suburban ivory towers and just talk about abortion or euthanasia or police brutality or war as if they're merely academic topics to be debated. These issues of violence really impact individual humans and it's our responsibility to really get our hands dirty and dig down deep to meet people where they are. There's a couple quotes I wanna leave with you from very holy people who have inspired me to do more. St. Oscar Romero once said, I am a shepherd who with his people has begun to learn a beautiful and difficult truth. Our Christian faith requires that we submerge ourselves in this world. And St. John Henry Newman penned a little poem that fits this sentiment perfectly. I sought to hear the voice of God and climbed the topmost steeple, but God declared, go down again. I dwell among the people. In these quotes, I challenge you to do the hard work of building community, of living solidarity, and constantly giving your life in mutual aid to others in that community. I challenge you to build integrated lives where your convictions and your actions align. You all are the future of this movement, but you are also the present. You have the power to mold and shape what comes next. I am so encouraged to see so many of you present and participating in this work. As I look forward to what is to come from our pro-life movement, I am full of hope because I see bold and courageous young people like you who are committed to the inherent dignity of each and every human being. So in closing, I ask you to build a movement together on the core principles of our shared inherent human dignity. A movement that rejects the violent two-party duopoly, that embraces radical inclusivity, that speaks the language of those you're trying to reach, that loves both women and children, and that gets active in your own communities. I believe that you can do it, that you can build the pro-life movement of the next generation. Thank you. So are we going to have a moderator come on or is it just going to be me talking? Okay, I guess. Okay, first question. Um, we have about 15 minutes for Q&A. So first question. So if we're talking about human rights, aren't we taking away a right when we remove a woman's option, her personal choice that could benefit the child if she isn't ready to abort a child? Okay, there's several questions here. 
there's actually several questions. Ooh, okay, there's too many questions in one message. Okay, first question. Okay, I'm sorry. There's questions pasted back to back. Hold on. Okay, one question at a time. So if we're talking about human rights, aren't we taking away a right? When we remove a woman's option, her personal choice that could benefit the child if she isn't ready to abort a child. Um, number one, thank you for the question. Um, and I think women's rights are absolutely integral to this conversation. And we need to be, uh, I think, talking about how um, pregnancy just naturally um, does put more of a burden on women. Uh, um, However, uh, I think all of us would agree that not all choices are illicit choices. Um, my rapist choice to rape me was not a choice that should be legal. Um, and there are people who might say, well, Amy, but a, you know, rape is always gonna happen. We should just move rape into a clinic where uh, the rapist can take his victim and you know, get a condom and the morning after pill and um, you know, uh, antibiotics and whatnot. So no STDs are passed back and forth. Uh, you know, that would really make rape safe uh, since it's going to happen anyway. Um, ultimately, all violence begins with a choice and not all choices are illicit choices. Um, so while I absolutely respect and understand, um, you know, even from a personal perspective, how important it is to respect women's rights and dignity. Um, I just don't think that the right to violence uh, should be a right at all. In fact, I, I don't think it is a right at all. I don't think the right to violence can be considered a human right. Um, secondly, I just wanna mention, um, I don't think that um, it is of benefit uh, to the child that she's aborting to abort that child. Um, like the, the child doesn't, um, you know, like come back when the mother is ready to have another child later on in her life. That's not how humans work. Um, so, you know, unfortunately we're in this situation where yes, women do have, uh, you know, more of a burden on them, but at the same time, we can't allow for violence in that case. So our best option is to really engage in that community in that solidarity and that mutual aid and support her wherever she is um, in you know, whatever life affirming choices that uh, she thinks are best for her and her family. But ultimately uh, abortion is an act of violence. It you know, functions by starving or dismembering or uh, poisoning a child, a living, child to death. Um, okay, next question. Capital punishment is not against the teachings of the Catholic Church. The taking of innocent life, on the other hand, is an intrinsic evil. How can one ever reconcile supporting a party that supports causes as abortion? Um, yeah, so I uh, don't support the Democratic Party. Uh, I think that as I mentioned during my presentation, we need to demand better. Uh, we need to demand better than the violent two-party duopoly that we have. Um, I also think that um, Pope Saint Pope John Paul II um, was pretty clear when he said that we don't need the death penalty in this day and age, um, and therefore that it is considered unjust to take a life when you don't have to. Um, and I definitely agree with that. And I think Pope Francis has gone even a step further. Um, and one thing that I'd highly recommend for those who have an, uh, a position like this is to read the book Consistently Pro-Life by Rob Arner. Um, he goes through the teachings of the early church, uh, including you know documents and everything from the early Christian church and demonstrates that the early church unanimously opposed all acts of aggressive violence, um, including capital punishment, including soldiering and war making, um, including euthanasia and abortion um, and infanticide, which was more common at the time. Um, so that being said, um, I, you know, I, I don't support the Democratic Party. Um, I, I think that we need to do better uh, as people who are pro-life to demand better from the Democratic Party and the GOP and perhaps for, 
find a, an alternative political solution uh, that respects human dignity in all circumstances. Okay, next question. Okay, excellent presentation, Amy. Thank you for championing the CLE. That's consistent with that. I noticed you often use no exceptions language talking about leaving nobody out, which I agree with wholeheartedly, but that you also frequently add qualifiers like aggressive or unjust when talking about opposing violence, which is language that seems to contain inherent exceptions to nonviolence. Isn't there a danger that such qualifiers can be used broadly to defend all kinds of violence as purportedly defensive? Is there always such a clear distinction between aggressive and defensive violence? Oh, that's a really good question. I have a whole other talk um, that's also like 45 minutes long um, on what constitutes just defense of self and just defense of community. Um, and though I definitely tend to lean more towards the uh, early Christian church's pacifist um, interpretation. And in fact, I think that the gospel really points to um, pacifism as the the Christ-like response um, to violence that I think um, are uh, like the concept of natural law points us towards this concept of um, just defense of self and just defense of community um, as at least like the, the, the bottom line, right? Um, and I do think that the idea of just war, um, et cetera, has been used um, in a way that is really exploitative, that um, tends to disregard the human dignity of those on the other side of the conflict. Um, and so we do need to be really careful about how we use those terms. Um, uh, that being said, like, I'm not going to tell someone who's being raped that they need to sit there and take it. Um, my position is that they have the right to defend themselves from that act of violence. Um, then again, you know, there, there is like a line between, you know, like if you have the ability to get away from an attack without doing you know, further harm and instead you decide to like wail on someone to try to prevent any further attacks, like that is an act of aggressive violence then like the, the victim has become the aggressor. Um, and so I think just the important thing to carry with us through all of these conversations is that the locus of all moral action should be the inherent dignity of every human being, including those on the other side of a conflict. Okay, what are our responsibilities as a pro-life voter in an increasingly pro-choice duopoly? <sighs> oh, that's a spicy question. You're correct though. It is an increasingly pro-choice duopoly. Um, I personally think that um, we should be doing a lot more on the ground action, um, you know, like in our communities to change the culture there on the ground. Um, I think politics has proven that you know, like the more and more it shifts toward shifts towards the pro-life or pro-choice side um, in you know just like the the political sphere that we need to be pushing back culturally in our communities, changing hearts and minds. And perhaps most importantly, um, I am unwilling to compromise on my central principles when it comes to voting. Um, so I, I always use this example. There was a politician who lived near me, uh, like was uh, one district over, um, Murphy, I forget his last name. I know my name's also Murphy, but uh, I forget, I forget his first name, anyway, something Murphy, um, who said he was pro-life in all of his public statements on the topic. Um, but then it came out that he had had an affair and tried to coerce his mistress into having an abortion. Meanwhile, he was, you know, talking, you know, at, at pro-life events about how amazingly pro-life he was. And um, I think this really stems from the fact that we don't hold our politicians accountable. Um, you know, like we continue voting for these people who say they're pro-life without doing anything about it and who end up, you know, casually being comfortable with things like racism and white supremacy. So I think we just, we need to demand better. Uh, we need to 
reserve our votes, um, understanding that um, you know if we don't do that, the the options are just going to keep getting more and more evil. Um, so that's I know it's like a really hard answer, and it sounds like it's a non-answer, but it really does demand that we get active in our local communities um, in changing hearts and minds and being community and you know giving in mutual aid to really demonstrate that our principles are holistic. Okay, if you could advocate for one public policy to make the biggest impact in reducing violence against the unborn, what would it be? From St. Louis University High School. Hello, Slu Hi. I love you, I miss you. Um, oh my goodness. Um, uh, so I think I would create a, um, a human life amendment um, that would basically say that uh, every human being has an inherent dignity um, as a member of a human family and as such deserves to live their life free from violence. That would also incorporate restorative justice systems. So if there were any violations of um, laws that would stem from that, that um, you know, uh, we, we would have a, a dignity respecting uh, model to go from. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's like my pie in the sky dream. Um, okay, Lucy13 asks, I passed my Canada safety babysitter regulations and had an idea. I was wondering if you had any recommendations of organizations where I could offer my services for free to mothers in need of childcare. Wow, that's, that's so great, Lucy. I remember taking my babysitter regulations classes. Those were great. Um, wow. So I like in, in Canada, things are probably somewhat different. Um, yeah. And this can be the last question since you only have a minute left. Um, if there are pregnancy resource centers there, I'd recommend it. If there are women's shelters, um, I'd recommend that. I'd also say going through, um, Sometimes going through like an actual organization can actually be more difficult um, for legal reasons. Um, so if you know, like I would just say like get active in your community if you can, get hooked up with a mutual aid organization in your community um, because really like direct mutual aid um, really would be the best way to not have to deal with um, all the legal restrictions that come from like working through a big organization. Um, because like in those cases, you sometimes have to get like background checks and stuff and underage people aren't allowed to help with babysitting. So um, yeah, <laughs> again, I don't know too much about the Canadian legal system, um, but I definitely say get involved with a mutual aid organization near you, um, wherever you live. Just, I mean, like, you know, Toronto mutual aid or Vancouver mutual aid organizations or women's shelters or things like that. Um, thank you all so much for attending and listening and participating and being respectful. I appreciate it. Again, if you have any further questions, you can email me, uh, amy at rehumanizeintl.org. That's A-I-M-E-E. -E. Um, and you can also find me on Twitter, um, where I, I tend to be pretty active. Um, I'm at rehumanizeamy. Um, I would love to talk more with you. So again, thank you so much to Georgetown Right to Life and everyone who helped put on the Cardinal O'Connor Conference. I'm so grateful that after years of attending, um, I got to speak to you all on the main stage. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. And I hope the rest of the conference is beautiful. Thank you so much, Amy. Your story and your mission was so inspiring to me and I'm sure to many attendees at our conference. Hi everyone, my name is Bakita and I am a sophomore at Georgetown who currently serves as the Director for Press and Public Relations for the conference. So we've actually been live tweeting at this event. So if you want to check out some of our quotes from Amy, um, please check out OCC on Life on Twitter, as well as our Facebook and Instagram. And before we move on to the next part of this conference, I just wanted to recap a little bit of what Amy said, because I just think it's so valuable. Um, let's remind ourselves that it's important to not just talk about unjust war, abortion, euthanasia as academic theories. 
these are real problems that affect real people and mean several things. We need to demand better from our politicians and uncompromising towards all forms of violence. We need to meet people where they are and encounter everyone. And this means rehumanizing those on the other side with our language, our actions, our hard work in community and solidarity. So once again, Amy, thank you so much for your inspirational keynote speech. And I'm sure though this will have an incredible impact on many generations to come. So at the O'Connor Conference, we seek to highlight the diversity of the pro-life movement and the variety of groups committed to the cause. This includes a plethora of organizations, speakers, as you have just heard, and also collegiate groups. And this smoothly brings us to the next part of our conference, the presentation of the Father King Award. The award, originally named the Evangelium Vitae Award, was created in 2006 to recognize the work of outstanding collegiate pro-life groups. In 2010, it was renamed in honor of Reverend Thomas King for his inspiring witness and dedication to the pro-life movement. During his nearly 40 years at Georgetown as a theology professor, Father King was a vocal advocate against abortion, euthanasia, war, and capital punishment, and was an invaluable member to Georgetown Right to Life, a pro-life group on Georgetown campus. The collegiate group who receives the Father King Award is selected through a rigorous process, and the criteria is based on evidence of their pro-life work. Each year, the winner receives a $1,000 award in recognition of their commitment. In a moment, I would like to introduce Georgetown President John J. DeJoya to present this year's Father King Award. For close to four decades, President DeJoya has helped define Georgetown as a premier institution for education and research. As a Georgetown alumnus, Dr. DeJoya served as a senior administrator and a faculty member in the Department of Philosophy before becoming Georgetown's 48th president in 2001. As president, Dr. DeJoya is dedicated to deepening Georgetown's commitment to academic excellence its devotion to Catholic and Jesuit identity and its global mission. Under his leadership, Georgetown has become a leader in shaping the future landscape of higher education. He is a past chair of the board of directors of the American Council on Education and is chair of the board of directors of the Forum of the Future of Higher Education amongst many others. It is an honor to have his continuous support of the conference, as well as Georgetown University support of this conference, and we are very grateful to have him here today to present the Father King Award. Please join me in welcoming President DeJoya. Thank you for the opportunity to join you in this gathering of prayer, reflection, and dialogue. And I wish to express my appreciation to the student-led Cardinal O'Connor Conference Board, co-directors Luke and Joey, and their partners, Georgetown Right to Life, the Knights of Columbus, and Catholic Daughters of the Americas. A special part of this gathering is the presentation of the Reverend Thomas M. King Award. This award has a special resonance for me. Father King was the first Jesuit and the first faculty member I met when I came to Georgetown more than four decades ago. He helped introduce me to our community's way of life and to the kind of academic work that was possible. When I was in graduate school in 1981, I attended an international conference Father King convened on Teilhard and the unity of knowledge. It brought together extraordinary leaders from the academy and was my first exposure to the work of Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. More importantly, it was the first truly academic conference I ever attended and was an example for me of the caliber and quality of academic work that this institution can do. Father King was a member of our community for 41 years. He served as professor of theology, scholar, distinguished author, mentor, and friend. He had a special relationship with our student Right to Life organization played a role in their efforts to host this annual conference and shared a deep understanding of the dignity of every human life. 
His dedication was recognized in 2005 when he received the Rupert and Timothy Smith Award for distinguished contributions to pro-life scholarship from the University Faculty for Life, an organization he co-founded in 1989. Father King played an enduring role in the lives of so many members of our Georgetown community, especially those who joined him at his daily 11.15 p.m. mass in Dahlgren Chapel. For 40 years, six days a week, during both moments of celebration and of sadness, he presided and offered guidance to all who sought peace in the presence of the Lord. In 1999, The Hoya, our student newspaper, named Father King as Georgetown's Man of the Century. Their tribute shared that, quote, no one has had a more significant presence on campus and effect on students than Father King, close quote. There are so many memories I have of him, but I always think of the way that he ended every mass. As he was beginning the final prayer, he would recite the words of the first chapter of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. Father King had a wonderful spirit and patience. He was a person of extraordinary integrity. It's wonderful to have this opportunity to remember his contributions. As we remember Father King, I have the honor of announcing the recipient of this year's Reverend Thomas M. King Award, the Boston College Pro-Life Club. I wish to extend my warm congratulations to Anne Marie Arnold and Gerard DeAngelis, President and Vice President of the Boston College Pro-Life Club. Thank you all for your presence at this year's conference. I wish each of you the very best. Thank you, President DeJoya, and, congratul and congratulations to Boston College. My name is Savannah Willard, and I'm a junior at Georgetown. I serve as one of the sponsorship coordinators on this year's conference board. Every year, the Cardinal O'Connor Conference is made possible by the generosity of many pro-life organizations, whom we would like to now thank. You can learn more about each of these organizations in the program through their advertisements. Right now, we would particularly like to thank our gold donor, the St. John Paul II National Shrine here in DC, a place of worship, religious formation, and cultural renewal that feeds the minds and souls of its pilgrims and visitors. Highlights include four floor to ceiling mosaics in its church and chapel, a permanent exhibition on the life and legacy of its great patron, and a first class relic of St. John Paul II's blood that is normally available for veneration. Although it is currently closed, we greatly encourage you to visit them virtually on their website found in the program. Thank you, Savannah. Hello, my name is Ana Ruiz. I am co-sponsorship coordinator and fellow junior at Georgetown. I'd like to share a few instructions as we move into virtual tabling. Many of our donors have purchased virtual tables in order to meet you all. These virtual tables take the form of Zoom rooms and our opportunities for you, our attendees, to meet and speak with representatives of the organizations who made our conference possible this year. Virtual tabling will take place for the next 45 minutes until 1.15 p.m. Eastern time. And we encourage you to take this unique opportunity to directly interact with as many of our sponsors as possible. We hope you'll be able to explore different life issues in more depth and in individual conversations. Please take a look at pages eight, nine, and 10 in the program for a list of our organizations, their descriptions, links to their websites, and most importantly, a link to their Zoom rooms. There will be volunteers with name tags. In I'm YouTube. excellent, Joey. It's so good to see you. Honor, I'm very honor. excited for today. If you have any problems or questions, don't hesitate to message them. With that said, we will move into virtual tabling now. Please rejoin this Zoom webinar at 1.15 p.m. for the panel discussion. Thank you and enjoy. <laughs> 